Hi, good evening. Um, I'm going to show you this time how to create a very simple user interface for a game that you've been working on in your class. This is kind of a little bit of a review from what we did last week, uh, plus a preview of what we're, what we're doing this coming week. So we're going to be using the ACM graphics library, the same one we've been using all the semester to draw pictures. But this time we're going to be incorporating user interface elements into it, like uh, text fields, buttons, things called uh, labels, which are just basically text on the screen. And then we're going to put it all inside of a nice window so that the user can start and stop the game pretty easily. So um, I'm, not actually going to show, I'm not actually going to show you how to make the user interface for the game that you're working on. I'm going to be doing it for a very similar game, and then you need to adapt it for the game that you're actually doing. This game is called 1 to 10, and it works like this. There's a counter that starts at 0, and the goal is to be the first player to get to 10. And then on each one of your turns, you can add either 1 or 2 to the counter. So, for example, um, over here, I've got something called the pile, which is the counter, and it starts out at zero. And then let's say player one chooses to add one to the pile, so the pile is now, is now one. Um, and then player two might choose to add two to the pile, so the pile is now three. Player one then maybe chooses to do two, so the pile is now uh, five. And then player two might, might do one, so the pile is now six. And then player two, uh, player one, excuse me, does two, so the pile is now eight. And then player two does two, and the pile is now ten. And so player ten has won the game because player two was the first one to get to ten. So that's how that's how that game works. Pretty simple game. All right, so let me uh, s switch back to this other screen over here. And this is Blue Jay with uh, what I've got here is a class called 1 to 10 that implements the logic of the game. So there's the pile, there's, um, actually I don't think I need P1 and P2, that's left over from an earlier try at this game. Uh, I also have a variable here called turn that keeps track of whose turn it is to make sure that a player can't go out of turn. So I've got a constructor that sets the contents of the pile, the counter to 0, and sets the turn to 1. And then there's a method here called move. This is very similar to the one that you wrote. It, you give it the player number and the amount. And the first thing it checks is to make sure that the player that is being told to move, in fact, matches whose turn it actually is. And so if the player does equal the turn, then we also make sure that the amount that they are able to add to the counter is either, it's either a 1 or a 2. Uh, but it also has to be less than however many are remaining, so you can't go over 10. So if, you're, if the count is 9, uh, player, a player can't add, say, 2 to that. That would go more than 10. So if, that, if all that works out, then we add the amount to the pile, and then we switch the turn. So we, so we uh, change it to either player 1 or player 2, and then we return true, indicating that was a good move. Um, but if this condition failed, it was a bad move, so we return false. And if the initial condition failed, then we return false as well. So there's two cases where it returns false and one case where it returns true. Uh, and then I got a method here called isGameOver. This is very similar to the one that you wrote. This one just returns whether or not the game is over. So if the number of tokens in the pile is 10, then we know the game is over. Otherwise, the game is, is not over. And then there's a, there's a who's won or who won. And this returns, again, 0, 1, or 2. So if the game is not over, so if not is game over, returns 0. It means the game is not over. Then, uh, but if the game is over, and if, if it's player 1's turn, that means that the previous player must have been the one that won. So if, the, if, the, if player 1 is currently up, then it means that player 2 actually won the game. And the final remaining choice is that player 1 must have won. Okay. So that's the, the logic of the game. And there are our methods. We have a constructor, we've got a move, we have a is game over, and we've got a, a who won. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the user interface. So I've written some of it for you. You'll recognize the overall structure of the, you'll recognize some of the words like canvas um, and, and, and things like that. But let me talk a little bit about this. The first thing we're going to see here 
is that we're making a class called GUI. You can call us whatever you want, but I just call it graph GUI for a graphical user interface. But it extends something called program. Now in the past, you've made your windows extend JFrame, which is fine, which was fine for the projects that we were doing. But uh, one of the problems that we saw with using a, uh, a JFrame is that when you like click on the close button, the frame just merely goes away. It doesn't actually exit the program, it just simply hides the window. The program is still running in the background. Um, among other things, Program is a class that the ACM graphics library provides for you. It not only gives the JFrame a default size and um, implements the, the feature where if you click on that close button, the window, the application will actually quit. It also does a lot of other things in the background for you. So we are going to extend program. Now just to let you know, program behind the scenes extends JFrame and adds on its a little bit. Okay, so you're just going to extend program here. You're not going to extend JFrame. We are going to provide a constructor, and the purpose of the constructor is kind of to set up the window. So you'll note here that we have to call a method named start, and then we can do things like set the title of the window. This is all I want you to do in the constructor, is just call start, and then set the title. If you don't set the title, I think the, the window has a default title of some sort. So you want to set the title after calling start. And then you provide a method called init. Okay, this is a little strange. You're going to call start, but you provide a method called init. And the reason for that is that there is already a method called start inside of program. Remember, you're extending program, so there's already a method in there called start. In fact, I'll show you a picture. Here we go. Um, so in this picture here, here's the existing program class. And in it is a method called start, which does things like set size, set visible. And the very last thing it does is it calls init. All right? So you're going to provide the init method, which start is going to call. You are going to extend program, and you are going to provide... You're going to provide a method called... init that is going to do a whole bunch of stuff like uh, put buttons on the screen, put uh, text fields where the user can type something in, put labels on there which is uh, just static text to appear there, and, and do things like handle button presses. So there's all sorts of work that your init is going to do to establish what the user interface looks like right off the bat. And so the way this is going to work is that when you go uh, GUI g equals new GUI like that. You can do that on the code pad. <clears throat> it is going to come in here and run the constructor of your extended class. Remember your constructor then calls start and at the very end of start it's going to call init. So this kind of bouncing around happens in your program in order to get it all set up so that it's a full-blown user interface desktop application. All right, so, so you call the constructor, which is not shown in this picture here. The constructor calls start, which is the existing method within the program class. And the very last thing start does is it calls init, and then you finish up setting up the rest of the user interface. All right, so inside of init, what we do is we create a canvas, and then we add the canvas to the frame. You've seen this before. And now here's some new stuff. A J label is just a piece of static text that just sits right on the screen. <clears throat> and um, what, what this is, is this called pile label. So this represents the number of tokens in the game, and the goal is to get that number up to 10. And then there's a thing called a text field, and this is basically a, a box where the user can type in something, and initially I'm going to fill it with a number 1 to prompt the user to either enter a 1 or a 2. Then I've got a label on the screen, and it says, your turn 1, so it's letting player 1 know that it's 
his or her turn to go. And then there's a button called Go button, and there's a button on the screen. So let me show you what the user interface looks like. It's not much to look at, I promise, but the goal is just to get stuff on the screen. So here's that label that says your turn one. Here's the pile label that tells you how many tokens are in the pile. It starts out at zero. Here's that go button. And then here's this text field where we can either type a one or a two, depending upon how many tokens we want to add to the pile. Okay. And then right now, the button doesn't do anything. So we haven't told the program what to do in response to a button click. All right, so the rest of the things to look at here is that we've added the pile label to you know, roughly the center of the screen. And then the amount field is over kind of on the left-hand side. The go button is sitting right next to it. And the player number is sitting way up in the, in the corner. And that's that one that says your turn, number one. And then we have the revalidate at the bottom to force the screen to redraw. All right. <clears throat> Oops, let me look on the screen here. Okay. So uh, let's see. What do I want to do? Oh, let's see. What I want to do is, as I said earlier a moment ago, that the, um, the button doesn't do anything. Okay. So we want to make it respond to this button click. Now, in user interface programming, and this doesn't matter whether you're talking about Java or any other programming language or pretty much any operating system, but uh, computers these days respond to what are called events. Events are external things that are happening to the computer. If the user uh, clicks on a button, that's an event. If the user even moves the mouse around on the screen, that's actually a whole series of events. There's, there's tons of events coming called mouse moved events, saying the mouse has moved. If the mouse moves over a window and that window is highlighted, like you know, the action of moving the mouse over something causes it to happen, that's like a, a mouse activate, activation event or something like that. Um, hitting keys on the keyboard are key events. There are mouse events like mouse clicks. Those are mouse button events. And also things like the clock ticking. Those are events. And network packets coming in. Those are all events. So actually there's this just gigantic stream of events that are coming into your program. And your program needs to react to them. So it doesn't need to react to all of them. In fact, the only one we're going to react to is the, the button click here. So that's what we're going to do. So the first thing we need to do is we need to take our button and we need to associate with it a string. And the string is called the action command. And actually a button click is called an action event. Okay, action event. So we're going to say go button dot set action command. And then you can put a string in there. Let's just call it go. <clears throat> and uh, what this does is it associates a string with a button. And the reason for that is that you may have multiple buttons on your screen and you want to know which button was clicked. And it's the action command that's going to be able to tell you which button was actually clicked. So based upon the string that is associated with the button, um, you're going to uh, respond accordingly. Okay, and then down here we need to say add action listeners. Now this is a method called add action listeners that's provided by the program class and what it does is it goes through your entire user interface, finds all the buttons, and then um, properly associates these action commands and action, what are called action listeners. So these are special methods that respond to the button clicks. This is all being handled for you so that you don't have to worry about that. Next, we're going to create a method, public void called um, uh, action performed. Okay, so this is a method called action performed. It doesn't return anything, so we've got a void in front, and it's public because we want everyone to be able to invoke this. So when they click on it with a mouse, it means, uh, when, uh, let me back up. When somebody clicks on a button in your user interface, it's going to cause this action performed method to be invoked. You don't invoke it directly in your code. The button clicks cause them to happen. So what you're doing is you're providing a method called action performed that's going to respond to button clicks. And that action perform method is going to be handed an object. 
So when, you, when that button is clicked, an object gets created. So somewhere in the background, there's a you know, new action event that happens. And then that string, this one that we had associated with the button up here, is put inside of that object and then handed to your action perform method. Okay, so, so I click on the button, an action event is created in the background, so, so the operating system does this. It puts inside of that object that string, that action command string, and then that object is handed to your program and it appears inside of action performed as an action event called AE. You call it whatever you want, I called it AE for action event. And so the first thing we want our action performed to do is reach into that action event object and pull that string out so we can see what it is. So there's a method inside of action event called get action command that will pull that string out and then it'll appear as cmd. And then what we can do is we can say if cmd.equals uh, go, go in lowercase letters, so the same that we've got written up here, this one here. Okay, so this is how you compare strings, by the way, is you use this method called dot equals. So you go command dot equals and then go. So if command equals go, um, this is where we respond to, to the button click. So if I click on the go button here, what I want to do is I want to reach into this text field over here, pull out that number that the user typed in, and then invoke the move method accordingly. All right, so remember the move method is actually handed two pieces of information, which player number and uh, the amount to take. So in fact, I need to add another text field here so the user can type in which player number. So let's, let's do that here. Let's go, let's go J text field, um, player field equals new J text field. And let's put a one there as well. Okay. Oh, and then let's add that on. So canvas.add player field, let's put that at 100. And then let's just, let's just look at it and make sure it looks okay. Okay, so there's two text fields here. This is the player number and this is the amount to take and then they'll click on the go button. All right, so in response to clicking on the button, we want to reach into the player field, pull out the player number. We want to reach into the amount field, pull out the amount, and then we're going to invoke the, the move method. Okay, so there's a couple things we need to add to this. First is uh, we need some way to, to have the, the game going. Remember, the game is in this class here called 1 to 10. So that's something that our constructor should do, is we should, it should create this 1 to 10 game in the background. So I'm going to go uh, 1 to 10, let's call it game equals new 1 to 10. Okay. And then here I want to go basically game.move. So I want to ask the game, which is this thing, to move based upon player field dot get text. So that's going to reach into the player field and pull out the text that's that's in there. And amount field dot get text. So remember that the move method needs to be handed two numbers, the player number and the amount that they want to move. And we're going to get those from the user interface. So we're going to reach into the player field, pull out that, that number, and we're going to reach into the amount field and pull out that number. And then we're going to call move with those two things. Now, if I click on compile, it's not going to work because, first of all, uh, action performed doesn't know what player field is. And you can probably guess why. It is because player field is defined inside of init, 
but it's needed inside of action performed. That means we need to move the declaration for player field outside out here. And we're also going to need to do the same thing for amount field for the same reason. Okay, so there are those two declarations. And then we need to remove the types from these to make sure that we're just setting their values. We're not creating brand new player fields and amount fields. All right. So we go compile. And now it says, I don't know what game is. Same problem. Game is declared in the constructor, but is not visible to action performed. So we need to move game outside and then just set the value inside like this. All right, now we've got another problem. Okay, so we're working through all these problems. This one says, string cannot be converted to int. And the, and the reason for that is that move expects two integers, but get text re returns a string. So there's a type incompatibility here. Get text is returning a string, and we're trying to jam it into a field that expects an init, uh, an int. Um, so the solution there is to convert the, the text into an integer. And there's a method called integer.parseInt that takes a, a string and converts it to an int. So I'll do, it works like this. Let's go int, let's call this p equals integer dot parse int, and then inside of the argument list for parse int, we'll pass in player dot or player field dot get text, and then we'll just put p right there. Because we know p is an int from this declaration, and it comes by parsing the integer out of the string that get text returns. And then we'll do the same thing here. Let's call this a equals integer dot parse int amount field dot get text. And then we'll put a here. Okay. So so here's one of the probably the most common problems when you're doing programming is that you, you have to work with the fact that uh, J text fields give you strings, but if you actually expect an integer, you've got to convert it. And so what I said the most common problem is, is that types are close, but not quite matching up. So a string needs to go in, but an int is expected, so you somehow got to convert it into the right format. Later on, we're going to find out that we're going to need to go the other direction as well. We're going to have to convert integers into strings, and then there's a different way to do that. Okay, so we're going to call game.move, right, and it compiles so far. And if we run our program, let's say player one takes two, we click on go, and nothing happens. But actually, something did happen. But nothing is appearing on the screen because it's up to us, the programmer, to make things change on the screen. So if we want this number to change, we got to do it. And if we want this prompt to change, we have to do it. <clears throat> All right, so I want this number here to reflect how many tokens are now in the pile. Now, I could do something like, um, what is that called? Pile label dot set text. And I could go in and I could just add two to that number. but that would be kind of violating the separation of concerns. We had set this up so there's a model and a view and a control. The, the model is the 1 to 10 class. The view is this piece up here that's init, and the, the control is this action performed down here. And if, if, the, if the control attempts to implement the rules of the game by adding 2 to that number, we're not letting the model do its work. The model should tell us what number should go there. And we're going to need to do that by having a method in here that tells it, that's going to be able to tell us how much is in the pile. So I've added this at the bottom. I added a method here called getPile. And this is called, a, a, in programming idioms, it's called a getter because its purpose is just to get and return the value of one of the variables inside, your class, inside of your class. So inside my class, I've got a variable called pile. 
and this getter is just going to simply tell me how many is in the pile. Okay, this is kind of similar to the status method that you wrote, but instead of returning a string with all the pieces in it, this is returning just one little piece of data. Okay, so we're going to set the text of the pile label to be game dot get what was it called get pile. So we're going to ask the game how many are in the pile, and then we're going to set the value of the label to be that number. And it's not going to work because action perform doesn't know anything about pile label. So that's this one. Copy. Paste. Okay, and then we've got another error, and that is int can't be converted to string. I told you we were going to see the opposite problem here. So set text expects a string, but we're trying to hand it an integer. Easy way to convert it into a string is to concatenate that with the empty string. You've seen that trick before in some of my other programs. Double quotes, empty string, and then just concatenate it on with a number. And now, if I put two there, that number changes. And now let's say player two goes and puts one in the pile, so that number changes. And let's say player one goes and attempts to put four in the pile, and nothing changes, right? Because move doesn't do anything if it's an illegal move. Okay, but let's, let's put this at uh, two. Okay, now there's five there. Player two uh, does two, that's seven. Player one does one, eight. So player two is going to do two. And actually, we get a dot dot there because <laughs> the text field was just big enough to hold one number, and now we're trying to display two numbers there. So a dot dot appears to indicate the text field is no longer big enough to display the, uh, the text. But that, that's a minor issue that we'll fix here in a moment. Okay, the point is that now that button click is causing things to happen. So just to recap here, every time you click on a button, it, it creates an action event, which is handed back to your program in a method called action performed. And you need to reach inside of that action performed, or excuse me, action event, pull out the action command, figure out what it is, and then act accordingly. And what we're doing is we're going to pull, pull the value of the player field out, value of the amount field out, convert them to ints, give them to move, and then um, after the, the move is made, we're going to change the label on the pile uh, accordingly. Now, uh, so that, that's a recap of what we did there. What we also want to do is change this text here so that it tells us which player is currently going. Um, so we could go, what did, what did I call that thing? I called it player num, and I can already see that I'm going to have to move this declaration out here. So I'm going to go player num dot set text your turn comma and then add to it game dot get oh I need oh here it is <clears throat> I have a method here called whose turn that just tells me who's the current current player so it returns a one or a two So I'll call get turn. That'll be appended onto the string that says your turn. Oh, what did I? <laughs> I've already forgotten what I called it. Whose turn? All right. So player one takes one. And now you see this is now changed to say that it's player two's turn. So player two takes two, that's now a three, and this is switched back to a one. Let's say player one takes two, this is now a two, and that's a five. So it looks like everything on the screen is updating accordingly. And I, um, I know you're probably looking at this going, oh, there's all sorts of things that I can improve about this game, and that's exactly what I want you to do when you're doing the assignment, is make this better. This is not only super ugly, but it's also not really you know, ideal. One of the things that you could change is 
why do I, as the player, have to type in the player number? I mean, why, if, it, if it knows whose turn it is, why can't it just fill that in for me? Or why does it even display it? You know, why do I have to type, why, why do I have a text field for that? So these are all sorts of things that you could improve about your game. <clears throat> um, so, so one thing we might want to do here is remember, uh, move returns a false if the, if the, uh, the move was a bad move, right? So we want to do something like check to see what value came back from move, and then if that was, let's say, a false value, put something on the screen that says, you know, that was a bad move. So let's go like if game move is equal to false. Okay, so if we got, so we're going to call game.move, and if its return value is false, we could do something like put a message on the screen. So here's what I'm going to do. And this is kind of a, a trick that user interface and, and games play all the time is stuff that appears on the screen is actually like, always there. It's just invisible sometimes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go jlabel bad move here and then init I'll say um, bad move equals new jlabel that was a bad move. Okay and then but I'll go bad move.set visible false, right? So that initially it's not there at all. And then I'll go canvas.add bad move, and I'll put it maybe in the, the right corner. So um, let's say 400 over and 50 down. Okay, so it's there on the canvas, but it's invisible. And so if the move was bad, I'll say bad move.set visible true. All right, so player one takes one, that's a good move. Now how about player two takes five or takes four and it goes, that was a bad move over here. So the message that was always there is now just being made visible. Um, now say, say player two actually now makes a good move and it's now switched back to player one. There's appropriately two in the pile, but this message has not gone away. Uh, so what we need to do is say else bad move dot set visible false to make the message go away if it was a good move. So if it was a bad move, make the message visible. If it was a good move, make the message invisible. Let's see if that works. Okay, good. Now player two takes four. That was a bad move. Player two takes two. That was a good move, and so the message goes away. Excellent. Um, all right, so another thing to do, the other thing I want to show you here is, you know, all the text is really, really small on the screen. I want to show you how to make the text bigger. Okay, so let's take, let's say this, this one that tells you whose turn it is. Let's make that bigger. Um, so the way to do that is, right now it's just displaying using a default font. I think it's like 12 point type Helvetic or something like that. What you need to do is assign uh, a new font to that, that field. So we can go font, um, let's call it big text, equals new font. So we're just creating a font object but we pass into the, the constructor three values. The first one is the name of the font, and you can get that by you know, opening up Notepad or a text editor and looking at all of your fonts and looking for the names. And then you have to pass it what's the style, like bold or normal or italic. And the third thing is how big, how many big, in points, you know, 24 points, something like that. So if I want to do comic sans ms, and then this is a constant that's been set up, so it's called font.bold, and we'll do 24. And then we can say player num.setfont, 
big text. So we're going to take the player num label, which is that your turn number one, and we're going to assign to it the big text font, which is Comic Sans in 24 point. And it says, I don't know what a font is. So import java.awt.font. There we go. All right, nice and big like it should be. Okay, so that's how you change fonts. Um, there was also the problem of, of this, this field over here, if you remember. So if I go to and then to, let me, let me just get quickly to the end of the game. It's eight. Okay, so that number got too big to fit into the field. So what happens is when you first create a field is it gets a size that's just big enough to fit the text that's displaying. And if you then change the text and make it bigger, then it, it no longer is able to accommodate the, the text that's going to fit there. So what you can do, um, let's try this out. Where does this go, first of all? Pile label, right? So I can go pile label dot set preferred size, and then you give it the width and height. <clears throat> so let's maybe make this, I don't know, 30 by 15, so 30 wide, 15 tall. Um, whoops, that didn't work. Uh, okay. I think I have to go to, <laughs> have to do this. Dimension D equals new dimension 3015. Let's see, is that going to work? Okay, don't know what a dimension is, so that's easy. All right. Okay. All right, so what I did here was for set preferred size, you can't actually just pass it two numbers. You actually got to pass it something called a dimension that has the two numbers in it. I don't know why, but you work with what you got. Okay, so let's go two. Okay, good. So by making the text field, the preferred size of the text field bigger, then we can make sure that it's big enough to accommodate the text when it actually does get longer. Okay, so you use set preferred size to sort of invisibly set how big this field is going to be so that it can accommodate larger amounts of text later on. <clears throat> All right. Um, what else could we do? So we've got our button. I could show you... Let's see, oh, when we have the, um, what was it, the, the bad move, right? You know, maybe that could be something like, um, now, let, let's make this one bigger. So we can go bad move dot set font, and we'll use the same big text that we had before. So I get to reuse that font. I don't have to make a new font every time I want to change the size of text. If, if, I'm, if I'm going to use the same font in multiple places in my program, I can just create this font object once and then recycle it over and over again. So put a three there. Okay, nice and big. Maybe I could do something like bad move dot set color, color dot red. And I'm sure it's going to complain about that. No. Um, set foreground. Yeah. I think that's it. There. So that message appears in red. But if I make this a correct amount, then the message goes away. Mm 
Okay, so as long as the move is good, the message doesn't appear. As soon as it's tried to, a bad move, then it nice big red message. Uh, what else could we do? We could make it so that the, let me run my GUI again. We could make it so that the button is not a word, but is like an image, something like that. So let's pick an image we want to put there. So how about one of these? But what I want to do is I want to make sure these are just icon sized. So I clicked on search tools and then go to, uh, go to size and I selected icon and then we can pick, pick something that looks good like um, maybe this one right here. Okay. So I'm going to do save image as And then here's my 1 to 10 class. So what we want to do is you want to put any images associated with your project into the same folder with the rest of your stuff. So here's my project. Let's call this Pikachu. And I'll put it in there. Okay. <clears throat> and now the way to handle that is you go image icon equals new image icon and then you just give it the name. Now the name has to <clears throat> exactly match what you saved it as. So here it is right here and notice that it's got lower, it's all lowercase, it's .png. So here's the thing, it's like on a Windows system the case doesn't matter so you could save it with a capital letter and um, when you opened it, let's say in an image viewer, it, it wouldn't matter what the, the letter case was. But to Java, the case actually matters. So if it's all lowercase, you've got to match it exactly. All right. And then what we do is we say go button dot set, I think it's set icon. And then you refer to the object, the image icon object that you created. And of course it says, I don't know what my image icon is, so import java.aft.image icon. Mm. Okay. Don't remember what class that's in, so this is where you gotta look it up. You go Java image icon. Probably the first link, and it says, "Oh, it's part of Java X dot Swing." Got it. Let me just make sure that works, and then I'll go back and show you what I saw. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I saw: was it says, it says class image icon, and then right above it, it tells you what you need to put in front of it. Another place you could do it is right here: Java X dot Swing dot Image Icon. So you know that's what you need to import into your program to make it work. All right, <laughs> and there we go. Okay, so there's, there's our little Pikachu icon. There's the word go, which is the string we associated with it, uh, with a string that we assigned to the button. So if you want to make this go disappear, oh, by the way, you, know, you can click on it. Um, if you want to make that go disappear, then when you create your J button, just don't give it a string. And now, there's still a, an action command string associated with the button, but there's only an image to display here. Oops. Player two takes two. There we go. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to do is make it so that when the game ends, there's some kind of message put on the screen. So what we have to do is do it like somewhere in here. So we're going to, uh, in response to the button click, we're going to do a move. We check to see if it's true or false. And then after the move is complete, well, let, let's go ahead and set the text and set this stuff here. 
So we're going to say if game dot is game game over. So if the game is over after doing a move, we want to see who won. So we can go int winner equals game dot who won. So we'll ask the game who won, and then we can put a label on the screen. So we can go J, and this is the only place where this J label is needed. So I'm going to define it right here. J label. Um, Let's call it win equals new j label u1 plus winner uh, plus an exclamation mark. Okay, so the message will be u1 2 or u1 1, and then we'll put it on the screen. So we'll go canvas dot add win, and let's put it near the bottom. So maybe 200 over and uh, 300, 400 down, something like that. And then, oh, it says I don't know what canvas is. Oh, so maybe a better way to do this is to put this label, rather than making the canvas be a, a variable that's av available everywhere, why don't we do like we did with the, the bad move We'll do that here, and then um, we'll say winner label dot set text there, and then we won't add it because it'll already be on there. We'll just say winner label dot set visible true. Okay. And the last thing to do, where's my winner label? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling around trying to find it. Let me I need to start separating things. There's my amount. There's that player field, player and all the stuff for player number. I like this now it's more kind of separated out. So winner label equals new, j label, and initially nothing in there. Winner label dot set visible false, and then winner label dot, oh sorry, canvas dot add winner label, what did I say? Like 300 over and 400 down, or 200 over, something like that. All right, let's try it. Okay, player one takes two. Boom, player two takes two. Player one takes two. Player two takes two. Player one takes two. Uh-oh. I don't see my label. Okay, hmm. All right, what's going on here? Oh. Um, yeah, uh, let's see, 200 over, yeah, okay, there's the label. If, so if the game is over, see who won, set the text and make it visible. So how do we know what's going on here? So there's a couple of possibilities, and actually I don't, I don't know the answer to this, I'm, I'm a little perplexed. So one possibility is the label is appearing, it's just off the screen somewhere and we can't see it. Another possibility is we're making it visible, but the text is not being set, so uh, it's, it's effectively invisible because we can't see the text. And another third possibility is it's not detecting whether the game is over correctly. So those are kind of the three possibilities that are through my head. And so now, going through my head, so now we've got to figure out is how do we detect what, uh, what issue is actually happening here. So one thing we could do is 
when we create the winner label here, let's not make it false initially. Let's make it visible and let's put something in there so that at least we can see if it appears on the screen. Okay, there, there it is. So we know that it's supposed to be there. So we know that it's, it's correctly positioned on the screen. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and, and keep it visible at all times. And then what we can do down here, so, so we know it's correctly, it's, it's on the screen. We know it's got some text that we can see. Maybe the other issue is that it's not detecting if the game is over correctly. So let's look at this. Is game over? If, if pile is equal to 10, this should return a true. Otherwise, this should return a false. Hmm, that looks correct. If game dot is game over, if that returns true, then we find out who won. Well, let's let's run it and go through a whole game and see what happens. Two, four, six, eight. So I notice it's it's not changing down here yet, and now it should change. Oh, there it is. It changed. Oh, so. Maybe the oh I see I think I think I know what the problem was. Um, the label was on the screen, but initially we set the text of it to be tiny, right? And then when we changed the text to be U one two, the text was now too big to fit in the that, that little tiny J, that little tiny label, and so nothing appeared. We didn't didn't even get the dot dot because it wasn't even big enough for that to begin with. Um, so what we need to do is we need to set the preferred size of this thing. And um, what we could do here is rather than trying to guess what the size is, we could say winner label dot set preferred size. Um, but instead of, like I said, instead of guessing, why don't we just ask it? <laughs> how big are you? Or how big, how big should you be? So I think we can say, this, this is, I think it's going to seem a little weird, but let's try this. Winner label dot Um, get preferred size. Okay, I'm, I'm just going off memory here how to do this. Let's see if that works. Two, four, six, eight. Ah, uh, didn't, didn't work. Um, yeah, okay, I don't remember off the top of my head how to, how to do this. So let's just, let's do like we did before, just guess. Dimension D equals new dimension. <clears throat> uh, no, actually, a third thing we could do is up here where we create this. You, what would you say? You, you one. Okay, let's go. You one A B C D E. Right. So let's make the the text of the text field much bigger than it needs to be. And then when we change the, the text here, it's guaranteed to be big enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, see, see how it already says U1 so-and-so, A, B, C, D, E, but remember, we're gonna make that invisible here in a moment. So two, four, Six, eight. You won one. All right. So this is your turn two, but you won one. Okay. So here's some places where you can improve this. Is that you might want to make this label invisible when the game is over because it's no longer player two's turn. Okay. Um, so so that's so that's that's pretty cool. So it tells us who won. It only, it only actually let's let's go and change this so that that label is false to begin with, and then we're going to make it true when the person actually wins. Okay. But the last thing I want to do is I want to, instead of just put some text on the screen, I want to put a picture on the screen that's a, that, that congratulates, the, congratulates the winner. 
So in this case, um, image icons are good for buttons. In fact, that's the appropriate place to put image icons. But if you just want to put an image on the screen, there is a different class for that called gimage. And that's part of the ACM library and part of the graphics package. So you'll say gimage uh, yay equals new gimage yay.png. And this is a image that's already in my project folder. Oh, actually, let's, let's just go yay.set visible true, like we, did, like we did with this one up here. And then up here, we'll go g image yay. Almost done. OK, yay equals new g image yay.png, okay, and then yay.setVisible false, and then canvas.add. Let's see, where do I want this image? Maybe kind of towards the right-hand side. Um, so add yay to mm, 500 over, no, maybe 400 over, and 100 down, something like that. OK, so we're going to uh, load this image into a G image. We're going to make it false. And then we are going to add it to the canvas, but it should be invisible. And then when the game is over, we'll make it visible. That's good. OK, so player one. Player two, player one, player two, and here we go. There it is. <laughs> Happy child. That's my son. That's my son, Kate, in there. So if you win, you get to see his picture. <laughs> All right. So that's how you make a basic user interface for uh, a game. And so this all um, assumes that you've got an existing class that implements the logic of the game. So the, the class doesn't do anything with printing things on the screen, displaying things, getting user input. It just keeps track of the numbers. And then we have a separate class that implements all of the user, user interface stuff. So we talked about model, view, control. The model is the one that keeps track of the logic of the game. The view is basically this init method here that puts the stuff on the screen. And then the control is all handled by this action performed in response to button clicks. OK, so just to review, you're going to make a class that extends program. In the constructor, you need to call start. And then you can set the title if you want. And you also are going to create the model. So the view is going to create the model and get it started. <clears throat> init is going to paint the stuff on the screen. So we put a canvas on the screen, and then we put our labels on there. We put our text fields. We put our labels that are going to be initially invisible and then are going to reappear later on in the game. So things like the winner label and um, the bad move label and the, the yay picture at the end. And then we add those all to the canvas. And we do add action listeners in order to implement what are called the, the action listeners for all of the buttons. This is all handled for you behind the scenes. If you were doing this GUI programming from scratch, you would not have this add action listeners method available to you. You would have to then write all the code to um, add these action perform methods to every single one of the buttons individually. It's a, it's a total pain to do. So it's nice that, that someone has written the code to do this for us. And then you provide a method called action perform that takes an action event. It reaches in there and pulls out the string that's associated with the button, checks to see what that string is, and then responds to it. In this case, it's going to pull the, the values out of the text fields, call move, check to see if it was a true or a false, and then make that bad move label visible or invisible based upon that. And then update the, the other labels on the screen. And then if it determines that the game is over, it's now going to display a label on the screen and also display a picture. So we'll run through the game one last time. 
<clears throat> so here's this uh, player number uh, label that tells us whose turn it currently is. This is the number that's in the pile. This is uh, which player number is, is, is adding tokens, and this is how much. And this is the go button. So player one is going to add two tokens, so this number updates. Now player two is going to add one, so that goes to a three. Player one is going to try to do three, and that's a bad move. So actually it's going to do two, good. <clears throat> player two is going to do two as well. Player one is going to do one, and then player two is going to do two, and then you get a nice picture when the game is over. And uh, it says, you won, player two. Okay, so there's lots of places here where you can improve the game. You could do something like make this disappear. You could um, maybe, I'll, I'll show you maybe in class how to play a sound. So if the, if the game is over, play a sound, change the icons on here, change the background color, change the pictures that are shown, completely revamp the whole user interface, make it look totally different from this. You may have your own concept of what you want it to look like. Um, you can do some animations, so you can make something bounce around on the screen in response to something, um, in response to something happening on, on in the game. All right, so that's how you make a basic user interface. Um, I think that's it for now. If anyone's got some questions, please post them on the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll see you in class. Bye bye.